I would now like to introduce today's presenters. Nidith Mithal, Vice President. He is a member of the technology practice covering digital transformation and applications. He covers horizontal technology areas across AI, automation, data and analytics, interactive services, IX, and IoT. David Rickard, Vice President. He leads Everest Group's sourcing, vendor management, and customer experience management services offerings for EMEA clients, as well as select global accounts. And finally, Anurag Srivastava, Vice President. He is a member of the global sourcing team and assists clients on topics related to location optimization, benchmarking, and global service delivery strategy. And with that, I would like to turn things over to Nitish. Thank you. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, my name is Nitish Mittal, uh, and I'll help kick things off uh, as we dive into the topic for the discussion. Before we start, I do want to address the elephant in the room. Uh, when we speak of Europe and when we speak of digital transformation, I know we are in 2021, uh, despite what, what most indications look like. Uh, but when we refer to Europe, we will include the UKI as well. Uh, we will talk a little bit more about how this opportunity changes uh, between Europe uh, and different markets in Europe and UK and Ireland. Uh, but I wanted to set that out there. Uh, and it's interesting uh, on a second level on the reason we're talking this week. Uh, just earlier this week, the European Commission laid out uh, its 2030 roadmap uh, and what it's calling the uh, European Digital Decade, uh, which includes uh, a host of things, but more importantly, some targets include how nearly three quarters of all companies in Europe will be using cloud services by 2030 and making all public services available online. So this is clearly a very exciting time as we think about what's happening both in terms of the market and also regulatory frameworks to allow for innovation to bloom. Uh, with that, uh, we thought it's a good idea to start with the poll uh, to understand the sentiment behind spending within this market. So you'll now be able to vote uh, on this poll, which really wants to understand how do you, how bullish or bearish, or what's your sense on digital transformation spend in Europe in this year? And we'd love to see what you hear, what what you're seeing, uh, and react to that. I think we should have another thirty seconds. I see a lot of the votes are coming in. And now we start to see some consensus, which is always interesting to see. Great. Yep. I think we have the poll results, uh, which you can now see. And I think, uh, you know, there, there is consensus as far as there can be consensus in a wide group like this, where a lot of you are bullish uh, on the prospects of digital transformation spend. Uh, most of you, or nearly a third of you, over a third of you feel that that's going to increase by 21 to 40 percent, uh, which uh, is broadly the market consensus. And when we look at our enterprise customers, we see that resonating as well. So it's glad to see that we're we're on the same page. We're seeing similar trends, and we'll hopefully unpack a little bit more of this as we go along. So if we uh, start thinking about what we are seeing from clients, uh, so as we move on from poll uh, and start looking at some of our research, we'll so the first section of the webinar will focus a little bit more on. What are we seeing in terms of the market and how is this bullish momentum translating into what's happening out there? And this is an interesting poll that we did with a select group of clients just at the end of last year, where we asked them one simple question, what's their sentiment about financial performance in 2020? Uh, and if you really look at the highlighted portion here, European enterprises or European centered headquartered enterprises were the most bullish in terms of not just meeting their 2020 targets, but also exceeding it slightly ahead of similar enterprises in North America and APAC. So what this tells us is, you know, while uh, a lot of businesses and the society at large did struggle at the beginning of the pandemic, like in many other parts of the world, uh, you know, the whole community as a whole really uh, ended the year on a strong note, uh, which was heartening to see. And what we are starting to see is, in, in a sense, a V-shaped recovery. 
uh, as you move on, David, uh, as you think about what's happening from a macroeconomic perspective, does that tally up with what we're seeing in terms of the market recovery? Yeah, thanks, Nitish. Yeah, I, th I think it does. As you can see from the, this chart on the screen right now, uh, a recent IMF study back from January 2021 so that while the UK and, and the euro area took a big dip in 2020, as all economies did, they're both expected to recover more strongly than other advanced economies that you can see on the screen, as including the United States and Japan. Uh, and I think a couple of the contributing factors that we believe are, are sort of, sort of um, factoring into that quicker rebound is, is definitely the uncertainty caused by Brexit has started to bottom out. So you mentioned it right at the start, the elephant in the room, but definitely the uncertainty around Brexit has bottomed out. And then also the strong rollout of the vaccine, definitely in Europe uh, and also in the UK, and definitely in the UK has driven up confidence. So people are thinking that there's definitely more confidence in the market based on those factors. I mean, if we move on to the next slide, we also talk about how the European industry is, is increasingly focusing in a number of areas, including customer experience, um, as we start looking towards the future. And in our recent key issues um, study that we did back in December 2020, we highlighted that there are a number of high priority focus areas that European organizations are going to be working on over the next one or two years. Out of the top three, the first one really is customer experience and something which is, is really close to, to, to my, uh, close to my heart. And meeting the ever-increasing expectations of cust the customer base is, is really important for organizations. And so there's a lot of focus going in on that. The second is to improve operational efficiency, which will help to control costs, but can also help to fund the additional focus on customer experience. So by offsetting the, the cost for operational efficiency, you'll be able to put the extra funding into customer experience. Um, and then the third is around launching new products or services, which I think COVID-19 has really drawn into, into focus as companies have had to struggle to look at new products or services or new ways of delivering those services. So they're really the top three areas that European industries are focusing on as we look forward. Um, Anna, I'm going to say it'd be interesting to see, are we seeing this new focus impact digital service delivery as well? Sure, so yeah, so if you look at uh, some of the data that's uh, that we've tracked on you know, market developments, right, uh, which is on the next page, um, you see that uh, some of this is manifesting itself on the ground, reflecting in reality, right? So if you look at the chart on the left, uh, it tracks the total number of center setups that are delivering digital services right uh, across the world, and we took a took a an average of what happened in the preceding three years before 2020, and we took an average for 2020, and you can see that um, very very clearly the number of digital services delivery center setups, uh, you know, breaking out by region, Europe is actually increasing its share right um, at the expense of Asia Pacific. Uh, and maybe to some to some extent North America, uh, and what that tells you is that increasingly uh, firms are actually leveraging Europe to base their digital transformation efforts, um, even even at a global level, right? So yes, there is a spike in leverage of Europe for Europe, definitely, um, but you also see a, see uh, many trends around increasing leverage of Europe to drive digital transformation at a global level, right? So even, even serving North America or even, even serving uh, your Asia Pacific uh, businesses. So that's, that's one very clear trend. The other one, interestingly, is also if you double down on uh, all the new European delivery center setups, this is across the shared services as well as third party provider centers, which is also the case with the chart on the left. Um, you see that, uh, and if you, if you see the you know, share of uh, centers delivering digital services across all kinds of setups, right? You see that um, that share has also gone up. So uh, in the 2017-19 timeframe, while uh, just less than 45% centers were delivering digital services, now almost half of them are actually, have actually a digital services mandate. And we'll talk more about what are the leading areas within digital services delivery that are uh, popping up more strongly, We'll also talk more about what locations within Europe are seeing more growth versus others. Uh, but the, I, I want to leave you with these two uh, very major, you know, uh, reaffirmations of the sentiment that we saw on the previous pages. Um, then on, you know, let's move to uh, looking at some of the areas within digital services that are, um, you know, uh, coming up more strongly, right? So these are the, I would say the usual suspects, nothing surprising in terms of what 
uh, areas are included here. Uh, but I think interestingly, cloud solutions, which we were seeing uh, in some ways had matured, had, become, had come in around the third, fourth rank in previous years. Uh, in the pandemic year, we saw that there was much more renewed focus on you know, making everything cloud, right? So migration of applications to the cloud, you know, on the infrastructure side, implementing uh, many companies actually making that move. You have, you would have read the news around, uh, you know, the proliferation in that sector. So uh, not surprisingly, cloud is number one. Uh, analytics, again, goes back to the mandate around, uh, you know, delivering new insights uh, to become more efficient but also become more effective by capturing customer expectations, customer trends, uh, as well as in many ways, we see analytics actually helping deliver new products, right? Uh, so it's a top line as well as bottom line. Cybersecurity, not surprisingly jumping up given uh, the orientation towards uh, remote working, work from home, and, and that leading to much more security needed um, at the end user end. And then uh, to bring up the tail uh, or you know, tail within the top five uh, is automation. So RPA as well as the cognitive automation, uh, you know, remaining strong. Um, you know, I think some of these are more mature, so you don't see that many new center setups relatively, but they're still uh, pretty strong in terms of uh, the established space. Um, let's move on, and um, I think Dave, you wanted to set some scene on what are the key areas that we see uh, focus on in terms of transformation. Yeah, thank, thanks, Anurag. So, yeah, I mean, as, as a result of this recovery, we are expecting to see it impact the market in, in three ways, really. The first would be around building internal capabilities. So we're expecting to see um, sort of more in-house digital delivery centers being set up in Europe, which will really allow enterprises to build and secure their own internal capabilities. So they've got control of that. Uh, which is giving them additional level of business continuity as well as we look forward into the future. Um, secondly, we'd expect to see improving service provider performance. And that's as a result of rotation towards Western Europe, as opposed to Central or Eastern Europe, as it has been potentially in the past. And last, we'd expect to see um, an increase in large deals being struck as well, uh, as enterprises look to work closely with service providers to expand their digital capabilities. So using the, the skills that a service provider can bring and partnering more closely with service providers to, 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 to do those partnerships, to be able to increase their capabilities without having to increase their own workforce. Uh, Anna, I'd be interested in your view on what the growing, um, the growing preference of new GBS setups in Europe is. Sure, sure, Dave. Yes, so, so if, you, if you look at um, you know, what we're projecting now, uh, again, a very interesting orientation or reorientation of the market, right? So, in the past four or five years, we've seen the both models have trended sort of equally, uh, maybe with some skew towards the GBS. Uh, but due to a number of reasons, we're seeing that the GBS uh, market share is actually now ahead of the third party share. So if you look at uh, man the manifestation of that in the digital services delivery, so this one, this chart shows you what is the share of the, the both the sourcing models in all the digital service delivery center setup. So these are new setups that happened across these years uh, in Europe, right? Uh, and if you look at the strong move from about a 60% share in the last uh, you know, preceding three years up to seven, more than 70% share in 2020, it is a clear reaffirmation of the increasing role of GBS in digital transformation, right? Uh, and we see a number of reasons behind this. Uh, one very specifically related to the pandemic, I think, a number of enterprises saw that they were better able to control their uh, GBS uh, organizations compared to third parties. So that, that sort of talks to this. Uh, I think in general, as they look forward, they believe that the GBS model will afford them better agility. They are better able to protect their differentiating, competing, uh, you know, um, differentiators, sorry. Uh, you know, GBS organizations also will tend to be in more aligned towards the common goals and vision. So is it more, do you need to care more about customer experience? Do you need to care more about cost prudence? Do you need to care more about developing new products, right? Uh, so there's a better alignment, there's more control towards what the ultimate goals of the next year are, for example, right? Uh, and finally, I think what we see is that um, employees within the GBS organization have a better business con context. They have uh, some of the business unit leaders in, in better reach. 
uh, and so that enables them to actually be more effective at whatever they're doing. So again, these are not things that are very difficult to implement in a third party context, but it, it naturally comes easier in the GBS context. And we see that is then manifesting itself in much more um, uh, confidence and focus on the internal model as companies move towards uh, rapid digital transformation. Um, we what we do what we do then is we look at some of the more specific areas uh, that are seeing action within uh, the Europe geography for activity, right? Um, so if you move to um, take a look at uh, what locations actually saw more activity uh, relatively, right? Uh, it's a fairly interesting uh, in many ways. So let me point out the you know two or three interesting facts about this. There's a lot of data here, right? One um, you see much more Western Europe. Or higher cost Europe in this list. So these are these are essentially top geographies that saw activity in terms of new digital service delivery center center setups. Right. So so number one, like I was saying, you see much more of the Englands and the Irelands and you know surprisingly Germany and Northern Ireland in the list, which points to the fact that um, generally for uh, digital services delivery companies are trying to be closer to their client sets. Right. So closer to the business, closer to their customer customers. Uh, second, I think very interestingly, what it also talks to is that uh, for digital services delivery, cost is not the key differentiator, right? Uh, and as you can see, um, you know, if you look at the GBS versus third party mix, you can see that some of the more higher cost uh, locations are actually more GBS oriented, right? Uh, in terms of the mix. Um, yes, you see, you know, third party, third parties actually setting up in uh, in the Romanias and the Spains to some extent in the in Germany and England as well. Um, but um, you know, what we see is that for uh, for digital services delivery, GBS uh, is actually going closer to the to the client, right? Uh, so there are multiple reasons. I think one um, uh, one to access a niche skill set, which in many cases are available uh, in these markets. Uh, second, very strongly, we see on the at least on the financial services side, some some extent on the healthcare side, you see this uh, desire to to be compliant with regulations, and some of that is driving this. And we'll talk more about some of these trends as we go along. Um, um, uh, the the other locations that see that see activity or that saw activity in the last uh, year or so uh, are also Portugal, France, Lithuania, Poland. So some of these, for example, Lithuania and Poland. To some extent, Portugal uh, were fairly important, fairly uh, strong in the past few years, but 2020 is a slight uh, skew more towards the uh, Western Europe or um, higher cost geographies. Um, uh, Nitish, I wanted to get your reaction on this. So this is the last two pages were more focused on the GBS side. I think you also see there's more GBS related activity on, on this page, right? In terms of uh, new center setups for digital services delivery. What is your take uh, on the third party landscape and how that reacted to uh, the pandemic and all the things that came along with that? Absolutely, Anurag. And, and I think that's a great point because as you will now move on and think about what's happening from a third party perspective, you'll start to see that this growth and this interest in exploring Europe as a digital services, uh, both demand and supply market is quite broad based. So we've looked at obviously how enterprises are enabling this by getting closer to customers and exploring these locations. As you move on to the next slide, you'll see uh, that this is also reflecting in third party services performance. So this is a chart which is similar to what uh, David discussed earlier when it comes to broader macroeconomic recovery. But this represents the services business of the top 20 publicly listed IT and business process service providers. So it represents about an aggregate $250 billion in annual spend. And what we start to see, and these are our calendar years uh, and quarters for each year for the last six or seven quarters, you'll start to see that Americas and Europe started to have a wide chasm a few quarters ago. And this was broadening, uh, principally uh, led by uncertainty because of Brexit, uh, decoupling of uh, certain markets and trying to, uh, as an enterprises figure that out. What we've started to see is while both uh, geography suffered in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, Europe's recovery has been a tad bit faster than compared to America's. And we see that gap narrowing, right? So again, this is a reflection of pipelines, this is a reflection of decision-making certainty uh, and how sourcing momentum is accelerating. Uh, if you think about another dimension, which is specific service provider performance, which is on the next page, you will see 
uh, you know, most large service providers with a reasonable footprint in Europe uh, uh, also showcase the same behavior. Uh, so all of them are starting to recover from the pandemic. This is just the European business and also the organic and constant currency part of it. And you'll start to see that they are recovering from the pandemic. Uh, some are recovering faster than others, but you know, essentially tells the same story, which is secular momentum. If we think about what that means uh, when it comes to the market, we are also seeing this accelerate large deal momentum. So the third dimension we want to look at in the next page is what does this mean in terms of large deals and how large transformations are happening? Uh, so this represents the large IT business process service deals that we saw uh, in the last three years in the European market, including the UK. And you already see that we are we have exceeded the number of large deals in 2020 over and above 2019 levels. And if I just think about Q1 this year, we're in the nearly in the middle of March. Uh, we're starting to see 2021 year, 2021 also become a bumper year in that respect. Uh, if you look at just you know the deal, metropolitan uh, the Metropolitan Police has signed with Capgemini just yesterday, uh, and if you see other large transactions that are underway in the market. Uh, so if you look at all the three dimensions of how enterprises are spending and setting up GBS or delivery centers, how service provider performance is manifesting this, and also large deal momentum. Uh, you know, all indicators really point to one thing, which is sourcing momentum, accelerating and digital transformation scaling. So with this, I think, you know, what will be also uh, helpful is uh, as you think about what that means uh, in terms of the market. So Anurag, do you want to talk about what should people think about to take uh, as they take advantage and try and tap into the market potential that we spoke about now? Sure, sure. So, so what we wanted to offer here is to all our attendees uh, beyond just thanks for joining in uh, a complimentary talent and cost check. Uh, so at right about this time, you should be uh, able to see a pop up on your screen um, that asks for, ask for a preference on whether you're interested in this, uh, just so that it helps you make that choice uh, in, in at a more informed level. Uh, essentially, what we're promising to provide here is some data on, uh, so if you're able to select the cities uh, and skills that you are most interested in, in the digital services spectrum, uh, we'll provide you some data on the overall talent availability, market landscape in terms of what companies are operating in these uh, cities with that those kinds of skills, and some rough sense on the indexation of cost uh, compared to some uh, standard uh, you know, um, locations. Um, just, just you know, just to describe the cities, uh, the way we picked them was it's a mix of you know, the usual suspects in the Central Eastern Europe region, but also some of the more uh, up and coming ones in in England and and Germany and so on. So, um, so yeah, so we look forward to uh, you know um, providing this complimentary check, uh, and if you can let us know your preference, we will reach out by email to confirm what are the skills and cities you're interested in most. Uh, so with that, uh, David, over to you on the, to take us through the next uh, phase. Yeah, th thanks, Anurag. So in the next section, what we're going to do is we're going to cover the where the opportunities are to, to scale digital transformation in Europe. But before we do that, um, there is another quick poll that we'd like people to take, if we could, please. So what you see here is what we're trying to understand is what will be the... What will be the key pillars of your digital transformation efforts in Europe? And there's five options there. So if we could open the poll, please. And the options are obviously getting the right talent, meeting your local customer expectations and needs, which are ever changing, local compliance laws, such as data privacy, establishing local partnerships and alliances, and then innovating to develop localized products and services. So if you could give us your view on that, please. And then we'll, we've got about another 30 seconds on the poll. So it's looking actually, pretty, there's a couple of leaders out here. Uh, it's looking pretty close um, at the top and there's, there's one that's lagging quite a way behind, which is quite surprising. But we've got about another 10 seconds and then I think we can close the poll. And I, th I think that what we're seeing is lagging behind is, is local compliance and laws such as data privacy. So that, that actually surprised me a little bit in terms of that. So in terms of the, the poll results, what we've seen as a as a, a joint leader actually is, is meeting local customer expectations and needs, which as someone who's really passionate about customer experience management is, is great to hear. Uh, and then and then tied top for that is innovating to develop localized products and services. So so I, I think that's an interesting result. And then the other the other three were 
closely behind with getting the right talent coming in third with 24% of the vote. So, so an interesting result there, I think, for, for it, but really calling out the need to uh, innovate to develop that localised products and services and then meeting a local expectation. So I think for a European audience, that's really good that people are really focusing on what, meeting the, the needs of their local business. Anurag, I think, if, can you start, um, if we move on to the next slide, start taking us through the areas that we're going to be looking at in terms of the transformation roadmap? Sure, David. Uh, although I'm a bit heartbroken as a workforce and talent strategy professional at the uh, you know third rank that uh, talent got on the poll, um, but if you if you move to the next page, uh, start talking about what are the implications of focus areas from a workforce strategy perspective. So one of the key things we see is that um, as the world moves moves forward and you know recovers from the pandemic, there are a number of forces that are acting on how companies should organize their workforce strategy, right? Uh, so there, are, there are, there's a bunch of forces on the on the left of your screen that were pretty strong even before COVID-19 hit, right? Uh, so technology was disrupting, you know, uh, strategy models, workforce models, um, including you know impact of automation and platforms and whatnot. Uh, regulations were pretty strong as well. Uh, you know, they were companies were dealing with U.S. visa regulations, Brexit, and GDPR in in the past. Um, plus, I think for a while now, customers uh, have have increasingly become more sophisticated in terms of what they're asking for, right? So they're asking for more personalization. They're asking for uh, delivery to be located closer to them, uh, vendors to understand their culture and their language and their jokes, et cetera, right? Uh, so these were pretty strong even earlier. Um, there are some that were, uh, you know, were existing earlier, but they got stronger as a result of COVID-19. So cost pressures, for example, a bunch of industries uh, did not fare very well during the pandemic, and so you know they are becoming more cost conscious. There's generally an increase in um, you know con congestion and competition for niche skills um, because everyone is focusing on digital transformation, like we are talking about now. Uh, there's a you know greater need to innovate and transform, given that uh, the world is becoming more competitive, uh, and, and you know need, you need to if you need to survive, you need to actually reinvent. Right. And finally, I think while there were some leverage of contingent and gig, and it was generally increasing, I think what we're seeing is that there's a bigger push to leverage this, not just for cost reasons, but also in many ways to, uh, to address some of the talent congestion issues. Right. Uh, and then on the right of your screen, there's a bunch of reasons or factors that are uh, predominantly emerging very strongly because of the COVID 19 crisis. Right. So, one is remote delivery. So maybe up to 5% of the market in some segments was delivering work remotely, but it has really uh, come, come back to the fore in a strong way. Um, secondly, I think uh, there's an increased sensitivity towards sustainability, climate change, given that uh, some of the blame for the pandemic actually rests with, with some of these uh, aspects. Uh, BCP has come back to the boardroom, right? Uh, while it was largely a delivery issue, it has become really prominent now, uh, given the disruption that happened. And then finally, in some markets, we see there's more, uh, because of increasing unemployment, there's more protectionist sentiment. And so companies are dealing with some of these issues. So net-net, I think what we're saying is that uh, for a lot of these forces uh, or factors, uh, the right answer seems to be uh, increasing your delivery in Europe, right? So uh, Europe is generally more safe compared to, uh, let's say, Asia Pacific and LATAM in terms of sustainability, uh, climate uh, impact of climate change. Um, BCP is driving some of that, for example, because a lot of the organizations are already pretty big uh, offshore. Um, and so they are scaling up in Europe to actually balance that concentration. Um, you know, need for innovation is driving more growth in Europe because there's some niche skills uh, available here. Plus, you want to be closer to the clients to innovate. Um, you know, uh, similarly, uh, if you look at regulations, uh, you know, uh, having delivery in Europe actually solves through some of your problems, especially with data privacy, data data protection, uh, and so on. So I'll not co cover all of these, but generally, what we're seeing is that a lot of these factors are pushing delivery more towards Europe, especially in a digital services uh, delivery uh, context. Um, and I think as we move forward, there are two things. We'll also cover, uh, go into a bit more detail later. Um, you know, one, I think, um, um, one, I think very strongly, uh, uh, there's a move towards more design-oriented delivery, 
uh, and I think uh, I'll hand over to David Dave now on what it, what he's seeing in terms of uh, you know customers customer experience management and how that talks to workforce strategy. Yeah, thanks, Anurag. Uh, yeah, and and I think when it comes to customer experience, there are a number of factors that are sort of changing the way that we have to look at customer experience and then it's presenting some challenges that we can address and Europe might be well placed to be able to address them. So the first one is around more complex interactions. So as we drive more and more volume out of the system through automation and elimination, what that's doing is actually leaving us with more complex um, issues to resolve. And what that means is that actually the agent skill levels need to increase and agents need to be able to troubleshoot and not just be able to follow a process. And this has made a bit more difficult to staff and to, to find the right talent for when you have to overlay that with a language complexity or a language requirement as well. So I, th I think we're definitely seeing a, a, a push and a requirement for more skilled talent who also have the language capability, which I think is then sec secondly echoed by customers expecting more of a personalized experience. And I think the poll showed that as well as organizations are starting to think about personalizing and really focusing on what the European customers need. But as customers expect that more personalized experience in both language that they're supported in, the channels, the availability, the out, opening hours, that's really putting pressure on both European organizations as well as service providers to be looking at the right place to position their, their support centers from to get the right mix of talent. And that's really looking, starting to look at more near shore where you can get the, the right level of talent that you need, um, but also to give you that level of business continuity as well should we need it. And then thirdly would be around sort of analytics and agent tools really dry, growing in prevalence across the business. So lots of examples where companies are using analytics to really drive customer insight, which really enables them to focus their experience and improve the experience for their end customer and drive efficiencies in the business. So all these three things are really sort of driving the way that we look at customer experience moving forward. If we move on to the next slide. What this shows actually is in a recent survey that we did back in um, De December of last year, we asked a number of organizations, what are your top priorities in terms of next generation technology? And I think it was very clear that 100% of organizations that we spoke to are all focused on self-service, so chatbots and IVAs, um, intelligent virtual agents. What we also saw, though, is there is a lot of focus around AI and, and the cognitive side of technology to really talk, try and drive and support agents in being more efficient and more effective, getting the answers quicker, which then drives at both efficiency, but also customer experience. And then following up on that is things like RPA, the advanced analytics and omni-channel, which again are all there to really drive and improve the customer experience. And these are, they're not European factors on their own, but obviously you have to overlay a language aspect to this as well. So as you start to think about this and how do you drive that and support agents more effectively, when there's a language mix and how can you take some of that complexity out so i think what we're seeing is that say there is a big focus around the digital technologies that would really help to drive the customer experience and i think we're also seeing that if we move on to the next slide what we're also seeing is what we expect to see is growth in the cxm market so the cxm market took a dip um, in 2020 from 2019 we're expecting to get that back to, to where it was in 2019 uh, this year and I think that the growth in Europe is expected to come from the technology se sector, especially that fast growth technology businesses, as they focus really back on their core products and solutions and look to outsource their contact centers. I think also enterprises in the energy and utilities verticals are starting to look at redesigning their, their businesses, adopting digital so solutions and partnering with CXM providers. So we're seeing a, an increase in companies starting to reevaluate their operating model focusing back on core principles, looking to work with providers to partner who can then drive some of their transformation strategies as well. So, I mean, th th this is the approach that the energy and utility sector are, are taking, and that's what's also growing, the, 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 fueling the growth in digital CXM. So we see the digital CXM growing to around about 13%, up from, two, um, from 2009 number of, of 11%. And I think, again, this is because organisations are looking to see how they can drive and improve customer experience, leverage the digital tools that we've talked about and really drive that customer experience, which will drive the growth of digital CXM. They will be doing themselves, but also working with service providers to drive. Nitish, I mean, are we seeing this sort of predict predicting the same sort of growth in cloud adoption as we're expecting to see in the digital CXM market? 
Uh, David, we are. In fact, as, as we discussed earlier, I think if you really think about cloud as the bedrock for digital transformation, given what the European Commission is trying to do when European enterprises are not rising up to aided by the hyperscalers, we see that evident in the marketplace. So what you see on this page and the data here is cloud deals as a, as a share of overall IT services deals in the UK and European region, and nearly uh, you know over a third of all deals have some component of, of the cloud. So it's strongly getting coupled with digital transformation efforts. Having said that, there's still a broader opportunity, uh, which is not just focused on cloud native workloads, but also broader uh, on-prem, uh, hybrid, and poly-cloud workloads, and then effectively what we're seeing as the multi-cloud movement. Uh, but you know, cloud as the fundamental unit of service consumption is here to stay. Uh, what's how also important is if we contextualize this in the broader view of how cloud has evolved. So we have an interesting framework on cloud 1.0, 2.0, .0, 2 and 3.0, which will come up in the next page. Uh, and what that takes a look at is, you know, as we think about this era where cloud becomes the fundamental unit of transformation, as I said, what will that era be defined by? Uh, so we are uh, effectively somewhere in the middle of cloud 2.0 and 3.0 by all estimates. Uh, and I think two critical things that emerge from the era of cloud 3.0 is really going to be about the sustainability and the sovereignty of cloud. Uh, this has more European implications. Uh, if you look at what's been happening with the Gaia X initiative, I referenced the European Commission uh, and, the, and the announcements this week, uh, and we will see that happen. I think the second element where we've seen that move the needle is sustainability. So what does that mean in terms of green uh, data centers? What, the, what does that mean in terms of renewable energy? And then the broader concept of technology sustainability. So those are the two things we'd like to call out uh, is really this enhanced focus. And in both of these dimensions, Europe in, uh, you know, um, in, in a way is leading the path and, and we're seeing that in uh, a couple of dimensions. So we are in the home stretch. So we'll try and you know, speak about this and then leave some time for Q&A. But if you think about sustainability first, uh, moving on, uh, as you think about uh, what enterprises are trying to do and what even regulatory frameworks are allowing for, uh, everybody's now putting money where their mouth is. You know, gone are the days where sustainability was something clients did just because they had to do CSR or they had to pay lip service to it. Clients are also realizing that good sustainability practices also mean good business. It impacts your employee value proposition, it impacts your brand reputation, uh, and there's a strong linkage to better outcomes. So we're seeing uh, large enterprises, not just digital native enterprises, but also incumbent uh, heavy capex industry enterprises uh, in steel, in industrial equipment, uh, take the plunge. So uh, sustainability and the active goals towards achieving this are here to stay. If you think about what, what that means in terms of where we're seeing the second conversation around sovereignty, that is what we'll spend a little bit uh, of time on, uh, which is the next page, which talks about how we are seeing this concept of data and cloud sovereignty, uh, which has a couple of dimensions. Uh, there's one dimension of uh, the federated data infrastructure with which the European movement of Gaia X is trying to do. Uh, it's acting like an ecosystem or a consortia. The aim is not to create another hyperscale provider like AWS, Azure, and GCP, uh, but can you create some guardrails around data sovereignty building on uh, from GDPR, right? Europe's uh, uh, thinking about its new Digital Services Act. Uh, here in the UK, uh, the government's mulling a new Digital Identity Protection Act, as well as helping on GDPR obligations. So this, this, this whole trend is quite broad-based. Uh, and what we are also seeing as a result of this is uh, the ecosystem react to this from service providers who are partnering with players like OVH Cloud, uh, as well as uh, consortia coming together around building applications and use cases which meet the, ne the need for European sovereignty and technology nationalism. So I think if you think about the implications going forward, how both enterprises create an architecture which adheres to principles of sustainability and sovereignty, and service providers who rise up to the challenge of uh, baking this by design, not just retrofitting, uh, that will be really crucial to, uh, to the future that we see from a cloud perspective. Now, if we, if we kind of bring this all together, Anurag, what would you say are the you know, uh, key things that we see uh, are happening, but also expect will happen as we think about uh, the next 12, 18 months? 
Sure, sure. Thanks, thanks, Nitish, for that interesting section on the sustainability a bit, um, uh, especially. So I think I think if you look at the you know sort of what are our key predictions for European digital transformation, right? So on the on the workforce strategy side, I think we'll continue to see more proliferation of Europe delivery, like we have been you know we we saw already happening, but we expect that to happen. It may it may take on different dimensions. So I believe that uh, while Western Europe is is uh, has grown more significantly in the past year, we see we'll probably see more. Central Eastern Europe grow, maybe some more Southern Europe growth as well uh, as companies, um, you know, come back to some of the cost prudence uh, and also try to then diversify the European portfolio itself, right? Um, the second, I think, is from a workforce strategy standpoint, um, we'll see uh, some more um, design principles uh, being used to thread all of that delivery together, given that there is multiple locations now, there is going to be more remote delivery, potentially some more uh, uh, smaller subscale even uh, kind of centers in terms of satellites and pods. So you'll need a very strong blueprint and design to uh, hold all that together. Um, from, a, from a CX perspective, I think we, we will see that um, because of the stuff happening in Europe around uh, you know, chatbots and IVAs, which are not, def which are not specifically you know, Europe, but uh, a lot of the innovation around that Plus the gig uh, gig CX and analytics and remote delivery and personalization of demand and and multilingual kind of delivery are more Europe specific. So that will continue to drive innovation in customer service models. And finally, I think uh, drawing from what you just touched upon, Nitish, I think some of these region specific uh, innovations in in these different markets uh, will continue to happen and drive digital transformation. I think the other thing we wanted to touch upon here was. Um, as you look forward uh, is the you know what are the challenges that companies will need to wrestle with right uh, so from a workforce strategy perspective uh, what we're going to see is that uh, you know while there's there's more design led uh, that also means that companies need to be more uh, sensitive and aware of uh, the increasing competition and congestion in the market so being more aware uh, of what is the scalability what is the Sustainability of arbitrage, for example, uh, for different locations at a skill level, because that's that's the level at which wars are being fought. fought. Um, so that is one key message. Uh, the second is, I think, talks to more to design where companies need to be conscious of what are the roles of different locations, right? So it's good to have diversification, but very important and more critical to have clear roles and boundaries around what each location or each center is driving, right? So is it largely a cost uh, play or is it largely a talent play? Is it largely something to deal with regulation, right? Or is it a language delivery center, right? So be very conscious of what the role is because uh, you need to have longer term justification of um, you know, existence for each center. Uh, and I think finally, more collaboration and productivity related tools uh, being used in workforce strategy as you, you know, increase your uh, complexity in delivery. I'll, uh, Dave, can you comment on what challenges you expect to see in terms of, um, you know, Europe driving the CX uh, innovation? Yeah, thank, thanks, Eric. I mean, I, I guess in terms of a challenge, I, th I think the biggest challenge is always the language complexity. But one of the things I was also going to add around sort of digital transformation and some of the technology that could be leveraged is that it, I've been in this industry quite a long time, and there's always been a lot of talk about translation technology. It could be used to help solve the language problem. And I think there is still hope that the AI may be able to sort some of that, those challenges out and make the, te uh, the translation technology actually work really smoothly. Um, so I think that that was something to watch out for moving forward. I think also the operating models that you talked about in terms of leveraging things such as gig and work at home in Europe can be really powerful as we start to think about hybrid operating models and, and sourcing language talent from all over Europe, not having to be in country to source that level of talent as well. So I think that's a couple of the other things that we would look, want to look out for as we think about predictions for the future. Natish, did you have anything else that you wanted to add? Um, I, I think, you know, I think we've covered a broad range of topics. The only thing I'd like to double click on as you think about the last uh, issue here, which is region specific operating models. I think the realization that a Europe's and Europe, including the UK, is not a homogenous market, right? So the fact that there are uh, these are fragmented markets at times with very specific regional nuances, there are a set of broad-based themes as, as we have discussed uh, in uh, today's discussion, but there are some regional specific nuances. So understanding that 
and recognizing that you know technology has to be purpose built or fit the need versus the other way around because technology is not the biggest challenge for a lot of our clients it's really uh, orienting uh, the workflows the business process and, and establishing that local innovation uh, and how technology can enable it so flipping the script if you will i think is important to understand these these models and that's why if you think about the innovation that we see in Europe and the UK on payments, fintech, and to my point earlier around sustainability, uh, tends to leapfrog some of the other markets. Thank you, Nitesh. I, th I, th I think we move on now to the Q and A. So conscious of, uh, we we've got about ten minutes or so that we could cover any Q and A. There, if you've got questions, then obviously please put them in. Um, the window, unless you've got any specific questions, or I mean, Anurag, do you? Have, I think you've just asked, but you said that you've got a question, so do you want to throw that one out first? Get us going. Yes, yes, I, I have a question that cropped up as we were walking through this. So, so both to you, intern Dave, and, and to Nitish, right? So maybe Dave, you can talk about the CX, and Nitish, you can talk about more the IT IT side of the house, right? So. We talked about the GBS model and the third party model, right? Uh, what is your take on the increasing play of contingent, right? Is that something you see will help companies, um, uh, you know, be excited about how to close some of the talent gaps? Uh, if so, what are the, you know, modalities and challenges potentially that companies need to be aware of? Yeah, I mean, I think on the CXM side, I think there is a, a part to play for contingent. I think, I think that, what we need to be doing or what organizations need to be doing is thinking about how do you get the level of training and, and the agent skills into that level of contingent workforce and how, how sustainable is that moving forward? I think we all know that actually tenure is quite an important thing when you're a contact center agent trying to deliver a, a good customer experience. So I think contingent will always have a part to play. And I think definitely to do peak management, then contingent workforce is always gonna be powerful. But I think from a contact center perspective, it's also important to have that level of tenure that you can then um, train the skills in and make sure that you get that level of continuity of service. Okay. Nitish, do you see that similarly on the IT services side as well? I, I do. And I think the recognition of the fact, I think what I'd add to it is, I think contingent workforce, of the, it, it's one of the ways uh, we see clients trying to solve for it. The other angle that we're seeing is, especially because of remote work and uh, uh, sort of right shoring is how do you, for instance, tap into uh, the gig or the crowd, right? And how do you manage that in the, in the way outsourcing has been managed, which, which is challenging, right? Because clients are used to perimeter delivery centers. How do you manage billing, security, partitioning in a crowdsourcing model? While there are obvious benefits, there are challenges as well. So I think understanding how you require those skills, how long do you require them, and what's the best model versus one uh, uh, one size fits all. I think that's a recognition that we're seeing from a talent sourcing perspective. Yeah, I think in, in my work with enterprises, I think what I'm seeing is uh, a two-pronged approach. One, being more conscious of where con existing contingent spend is, uh, and because that tends to be per, on a per hour per week basis, much more uh, you know, uh, in a so billing rate compared to permanent employees. So trying to be more conscious of where you actually need contingent and only there, you know, enabling that. Second is where the demand for skills is not, uh, you know, sort of long-term uh, or you need flexibility, uh, you need to access different kinds of talent, uh, then you actually orient some of your permanent or even outsource to more contingent. So I think I agree with both of you. I think we'll definitely see much more proliferation of the contingent model. Thanks, Anurag. There, there is a question that's come in. There's a few questions come in, and we'll, if we don't get to answer them today, then then obviously we will answer them all in, in email. One that's come in from Angelica, which was around, um, can, can the increase of in-house GPSs and DCs be linked with the fact that companies are not flexible and not ready to start and manage large-scale outsourcing projects in a short time frame? Maybe a good place to start there is Anurag. Yes, I, I can start off, and then you know each of you can comment as well. So I think I think it is less to do with um, you know not being flexible so much, but actually I would say it is the other way around. So companies, because they want to be more flexible, more agile, and have more control over the direction of their transformation, they are actually going to the GBS route, right? So uh, a very prominent example of a client we worked with where they said we are not getting the level of proactive transformation that we we believe we can get when we do this internally. 
from our service provider, right? Uh, so, um, so we want to take things into in, more into our hands. We want to be in the driver's seat. We want to be we want to be designing the transformation, and then we can take help from third parties in implementing it, right? Because ultimately, it is us who is going to set the direction. So, one, I think that desire for greater control, at least in terms of driving digital transformation, uh, and I think. Um, to be really honest, I think it is not an either or. I think what companies are saying is, uh, for some of the digital transformation work, some of the um, you know um, analytics work, for example, some work that deals with their high net worth, high high um, value customers, uh, for example, are more suited for GBS. Uh, whereas uh, other stuff where they don't want to be the experts or they don't think they're core to their business. Uh, and they are more willing to outsource. So, you know, we have seen growth in both models last year. Uh, and so for a, a bunch of processes, uh, you know, there's, there's more outsourcing as well. Uh, and so I think it goes back to what we keep saying, which is more, you know, you have to go by design, right? So what makes sense for you, uh, you know, will be very unique. Uh, and you need to then lay out, okay, for this process, especially at a process by process level, do I outsource this or do I keep it in house? Uh, and then sort of then start about start to think about how to orchestrate that. Over to you, David, Dave Nitish, if you're seeing something similar, do you have a different take on this? Yeah, I, I would then, sorry, David, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, I actually don't have much to add. I think Anna covered it pretty well. So I was, I was just gonna leave it to you. Yeah, and I think it's, and I'm not just repeating what you said. I think it's not a zero sum game, as you mentioned, because if clients are doing both, not or, or one of them. Uh, in fact, when we uh, review the large deal momentum in Europe, we see that to uh, actually much higher than in North America on, on the back of the pandemic. And we do see total outsourcing or large scale outsourcing as the question put it happening as well. I think it's a question of what fits what use case and to your point around thinking by design. In some, there's a, I think there's a sectoral or a vertical view to this as well in some industries like banking, we definitely see a continuation of the insourcing trend that, that has been uh, happening for a while, uh, but it, it does not necessarily mean a decrease in overall outsourcing spend because the total pie is increasing. Thank you, Nitish. A couple of people have asked just on, on the Q&A, a couple of people have asked, will they be getting a copy of this document afterwards? And, and I believe the answer is yes, so you will get a copy of, of the presentation. So, um, yeah, that's an answer. And, and, and someone called Maureen has asked, uh, will we be doing a similar event in the US for the all for the US market? Uh, I think that's a great question and we can follow up on that. I think we'd have to talk to our US colleagues on that one. But if, if, if the, the content has resonated, then we can talk to the teams in the US and, and we, we can confirm that in, in the future. Anurag, I think you had another question. I'm just looking down if anyone else has got any other questions. Oh, actually, so there's a question here. So we've mentioned the circa 75, 65% uh, of the market is still hybrid on-prem. Do you see this lowering going forward? So, uh, David, I'll take that one. Uh, so the short answer is yes, we do see that lowering. Uh, but do we expect a drastic shift in the next three to five years where the script will be completely flipped? Uh, not really, because, you know, I think while a lot of people are bullish on the cloud and they have reasons to be, if you look at AWS with, uh, you know, they just clogged annual run rates of $51 billion uh, and growing at 30% still. Uh, but what we have to also recognize is that nearly two thirds of all enterprise workloads, so two thirds, three fourths, depending on which estimates you want to believe, are still on-prem, have not gone to the cloud. So this is a, what, what we want to stress is there's a large opportunity to manage what we're calling journey in the cloud, not just journey to the cloud. So uh, how do you think about that will be very different. So we expect the on-prem share to come down, uh, but we, uh, you know, most clients will still live in a, in a hybrid uh, and or multi-cloud environment, uh, depending on the use case. Some of them will go all in with a few vendors. Some of them will want to avoid that risk. So managing that spend in a hybrid ecosystem, I think will still be a very important and a critical element in the next two, three years. Brilliant, Thank, thanks Nitish. One question, which may be an unfair one, so apologies in advance. And someone has asked, do we know what the proportion of spend by European companies is in open source software versus proprietary software? That might that might not be something that we know, but. No, but I think I can shed some quick light on that. So I think the if you look at the percentage distribution, European companies have traditionally relied a little bit more, about five to 7% more when it comes to spend on open source. But, uh, you know, 
as an analyst, I don't think about open source from the perspective of spend, which tends to be a narrower bucket. I think what we are seeing European enterprises think about when it comes to scaling of open source is the ecosystem around it. So open can can you know they will be using some element of open source anyway. But is there an ecosystem in terms of enterprise support? Uh, what's the level of the partner involvement in that open source project? Uh, what what does it mean in terms of uh, you know their needs of security and compliance? I think those are the three critical things which, in my opinion, tend to be uh, roadblocks. Uh, and if you get them right, then uh, help scale open source software. Uh, but it's not necessarily the cost of the overall spend itself, which can be a bit narrow. Brilliant. Th thanks, Nitish. And I think that's probably all we've got time for in terms of questions now. So if there's any questions we didn't get to, and I think it was only a couple, we, we will make sure we come back and answer that uh, those questions in email. So um, apologies if we haven't got to them. So I think if we move on to the next slide, there's just a couple of closing slides to, to go through. So, so if you've enjoyed any of the content that we've talked about here, and ho hopefully you have, then obviously you can take a look at our website. We've got quite a lot of content up there. Um, myself, Anurag and Nitish regularly posting blogs and thought pieces, et cetera. So you, you can take a look at all of our content on our website. Uh, and I think that's pretty much it for today. I think there's, there's some link that you'll get as part of the deck in terms of the related content. So some of the source material that we've used today, is also up available on our website. But thank you for joining today. I, th I think hopefully you found it useful uh, and you've got our email addresses, which is at the beginning of this presentation, if you've got any questions or any follow-up that you, you would like. Thanks for joining.